Hey, welcome Talent Warriors to episode 13 of the Talent War podcast. Today, we're going to make it short and sweet as I talk with Carly Walden. And we're going to have a conversation about the great resignation, what managers, leaders, organizations can do to attract and retain their top talent. Now, Carly Walden is truly one of the best leaders that I've ever worked with, a former U.S. Air Force cryptologic language analyst. And she speaks six languages, distinguished herself across multiple intelligence agencies on several classified but critical missions and in several hostile areas. You know, after a great career in the Air Force, she and I had the great privilege to work together. And she was the senior leader for all global sales recruiting, truly an expert in designing, building, and executing complex talent strategies and helping business leaders attract the absolute top and best talent. So stand by as we hear from the best. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Talent War Podcast. Today, we're going to do a really short segment on what's being called the Great Resignation. In every article, every LinkedIn post, every fifth LinkedIn post, it's about the resignation, it's about hiring. So I thought today might be a good day for Carly, our president here at Talent War Group and somebody I've worked with for a number of years, who's really the best at her craft to just talk about some of the things that we've done and some of the way that you as leaders can face up and tackle the great resignation. So with that, I've got Carly Walden, the president and COO of the Talent War Group. And folks, truly, truly the best recruiter that I've worked with and absolutely one of the best leaders. But Carly, I know when I'm talking with our clients, Nayar gave us a bunch of statistics and we've both seen them, but it's like 62% of employees now are on an active job search. And so I know I'm hearing it from clients. Is that what you're getting when you're coaching and working with our clients? It is. Well, first, George, hey, thanks for having me on. And this is a really exciting topic for me. And that's, I come from the HR world. So (laughs) it shows you a lot about um, how much fun we don't have in HR a lot of the times. But this is a super relevant topic. And it's really not industry agnostic at all. It's applying to everyone across the board. And so I've heard of it referred to, I think it was McKinsey. They're calling it the great attraction or the great resignation or something like that. I've heard a few different terms, but nonetheless, it is the number one problem that companies are facing right now. It doesn't matter how great their company is, or they think it is, that's really what it boils down to, how great their company is, what industry they're in, everyone is facing this problem right now. So to go back to your question, yeah, a lot of clients that I'm speaking with right now, they might come to us for one specific issue, but it all revolves around this one topic right here. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is For those listeners, on occasion, we get this opportunity for Carly or Mike Sorelli or myself to go speak to a group of people. And they send you this pre-speech questionnaire, and they asked my opinion about things. And they were talking about the Great Resignation as though it was strictly COVID-related. And one of the things that I flipped back at them is I said, I think what COVID did Well, it did a couple of things. Number one, first of all, people had to all of a sudden halt and get used to working remote. So they changed their whole life. They start working remote. They start delivering results. And some companies had to shed employees from a revenue perspective, a lack of demand for their services or their product or whatever. I said, but really what this did, it may have been COVID as kind of the precipitating event or the causing event but exposed leadership. And so all of a sudden I said, oh, by the way, it isn't just because of COVID. I said, but now people are like, oh, people are vaccinated. We can bring it back to the office. Everybody come back into office. And you'd think that the leaders would have caught on that this isn't great resignation, isn't simply COVID or vaccinations or work from home. 
it's a leadership issue for Christ's sake. How the hell did you miss that? And that's what's driving me nuts. COVID really sped this up. Like you said, this was bound to happen. COVID just came in place and just sped it up however many years. And I've heard people debate that, whether it's three years, five years, 10 years. But people are reevaluating what they value, what motivates them to stay at a company and what they value in an organization. And what used to work is not necessarily working for everyone anymore. I had one client asking me, what do we do? And I said, well, you doubled down on investing in building great leaders. And you and I, I remember coming into, and we aren't going to name firms on this podcast, but I walked in and I remember walking into, you were already there. I was, And yeah. what a toxic sometimes, I don't think quite gets it. It was just the weirdest environment. And I walked in, and I'm like, WTF. I mean, I don't want to say that on the podcast, but I'm like, what in the hell's going on here? But we were able to figure that out. We were able to work through a very difficult environment. And so before I ask you the question, I was just going to say that we're going to make this a very short podcast, but I wanted to share with people that it doesn't matter about COVID. It comes down to leadership. Every problem is a leadership problem. And if you're a good leader, your company can be whatever it is, but you as a leader are responsible for your portion of whether your employees are engaged, valued, and taken care of. And I don't know, you weren't getting much of that before we built the team that you and I built. Exactly. Yeah, there wasn't a pandemic to blame back then for a (laughs) lack of leadership and poor culture, toxic culture amongst the whole bunch of different things that were happening. And so as we do speak to some of our clients, some of these issues that are popping up where they're having high attrition, and again, everything, all problems are a leadership problem. You can't use that as an excuse, right? Because as George, going back to this company who shall not be named, as soon as you came in and you diagnosed what was going on and certainly built some really solid rapport with the team, things shot up and people had a purpose. People understood the why. And you really instilled a really solid framework for success because prior to that team was, I think, reactive at best and they were the doormat to the business. And so, yeah, I mean, who wants to work in that type of environment? Yeah, it was crazy. And I think what struck me is this, I looked around and I kind of remember doing this assessment. I was like, there's a lot of talent here. And so what I would share with the leaders that are listening to this, you need to look around and take stock of what you have, especially so because there are some companies that are having to lean out. And so you're asking your employees, your teams to do even more. But what I was responding to the speech is that I was hoping would happen. As I said, leaders or managers, because they're not leading clearly, stop taking their teams for granted. And we've had to talk to clients about that. And they think it's just a matter of filling positions with the right people that you can hire your way to success. But that's not true. You're spot on. There's been so many different surveys out there. And we did one ourselves um, about a month ago. And it was showing that I think ours was 62% of people who had left the role, they left because of lack of leadership. It wasn't because of a vaccine mandate. It wasn't because they didn't have flexibility in this. It was or that it was because of a lack of leadership. I think really when I was responding to that inquiry, it's kind of like the perfect storm is that you have the pandemic, there's the requirements to be vaccinated. Some people don't want to get vaccinated. It's their choice, whether they do or whether they don't. And then the employers have the right, whether they let people back on into their facilities, whether they're vaccinated or they have to be vaccinated. And then people getting used to remote work. And then you throw bad leadership on top of that. That is a hell of a cocktail for leaders to deal with. Right. And I spoke with some leaders here 
recently who they are using all of this as an excuse for why all these things are happening in their company. And a lot of them are like department heads. Obviously, we speak with CEOs and COOs and such. But when I'm speaking, let's say it's a VP of sales or a head of marketing or whatever, they're using this as an excuse. And I want to point them back to, okay, all this stuff is going on. This stuff is going to go on and you're going to be working in an unknown. There's going to be so many unknowns. Policies are going to be changing by the hour, it feels like at some times. But you as a leader, A, have the responsibility, but you have the power to create your own subculture. If the company culture feels toxic or maybe there's a lack of leadership upstream, you can still block that from your team. So you're enabling your team to do their best work and you're motivating them to stay at your company and you show that you value them, right? Because that's important. Why the heck are you going to go work somewhere when you have other options when your current employer isn't valuing you and what you bring to the table, right? Carly, I'm going to steal the phrase. You're right. I think that's probably the best point that we can bring up is that you can't use COVID as an excuse for why people are leaving. It's not COVID. Now, it may produce the rare circumstance that Things aren't working out and that person has now got some responsibilities at home that being home works better. But it can't be an excuse for poor leadership. I was just talking to the person that I was coaching this morning and I said, it's all on your shoulders, dude. You're either leading or you're not. And too many leaders are. I think you're absolutely right. Using COVID as an excuse when this really should be the motivator to say, how do I get to be the boss that I would work for? Because that's kind of how I approached our team. And I think that's how people looked at you when you were leading your global team is, hey, I want to be like Carly. I want to make sure. And so people watched you like a hawk. It's like your desire to be a great leader actually caused everybody to look at you more sharply and drive the standards higher. So leading in your team, regardless of the rest of the company, I think you just nailed that, but you were so good at that. What would you tell junior and senior leaders that is most important to you? I think that there's always going to be a pandemic of some sort or an issue or something, right? Whether it's COVID or your company is being bought out by a PE firm, or say you're a publicly traded company and you know Q2 results are well below projection. There is always going to be something, but you as a leader can be a constant, right? And I appreciate everything that you have said about me and being a leader and you got to see me in action and I got to learn from the best in working for you in a previous life. But for me, I am always figuring out And you know me, like on the margins, where can I get better? And like, we all have tough days as leaders, but as soon as I crack, then that opens the door for something to happen. And so I have to be a constant. doesn't mean I'm not vulnerable with my people when times are appropriate, but I would say that there's always going to be a pandemic. There's always going to be a crisis. There's always going to be something that doesn't work in your favor. And that can be an excuse, right? So once you move out of that mindset, and it's almost like the victim mindset a little bit, like, okay, all right, it is what it is. There is nothing that you can do to change it. But what you can do is you can be a badass leader. (laughs) And you can be somebody that people want to work for, that people like, they will give their right arm to have an opportunity to work on your team, right? So George, we've talked about this before in other conversations, like how important an employee value proposition is, like why should people come and work for your organization? And it's been talked about a little bit. There's not a ton out there about it, but it's called a leadership value proposition. Not why should people come and work for the company? Why should people come and work for you, right? If it's a candidate's market, And it's not just, why should you come work for my company? Why should I hire you? Like you have to sell yourself as a leader too, right? Like, do you have a proven track record 
successful track record that is, <laughs> not a proven bad track record, <laughs> of developing and retaining top talent. What are those examples? I feel like I am coaching clients now how I used to coach candidates five years ago. That's a real good point. I like that. I think that's the question I used to prep candidates and there's all kinds of questions I can ask candidates that stump them. But I was so surprised to your point, Carly, when I would ask managers and some of these searches that we're doing now, we just picked up the search for the CHRO. We're doing multiple COO searches. And one of the questions I I, I was on a call at 11 o'clock and I asked the guy, I said, well, why should somebody work for you? And you could hear that audible gasp, like, I can't believe he asked me the question, how audacious is he going to be? And at the same time, he was like, but wait a minute, I don't have an answer. And it's true. I mean, that's crazy. And I'm going to curveball it a little bit because I want to share a war story because you said I should be on guard, but I'm going to put you on guard. Is when I met you, you were a contractor, I was, yeah. And I remember asking you what it took to be full time. <laughs> and I was trying to sell myself. And I'm not sure I wasn't doing as poor a job as many of the people we talked to, but it certainly wasn't good. I remember the look on your face, which is like, eh, we'll see if you can deliver on what you're talking about. But even you and I working together, it's the very same point. Why should you be working for me? And it's amazing that people can't answer that question. It drives me of many things, people think they're selling a role, but they're actually selling their leadership and investment. This episode is sponsored by Talent War Group, a management consulting and executive search firm. We help you attract, retain, and develop your top talent because we know that the most valuable asset within your organization is your talent. With services like leadership development, talent acquisition and HR consulting, executive search, executive coaching, and keynote speeches, We work with you to create talent solutions to your most pressing business problems. You can get started by finding us at talentwargroup.com and let us help you develop your next generation of leaders. Also, if you like what we're doing here at the podcast, please leave a review as it helps us support and continue this podcast. It helps us support people who are really dedicated to improving their business skills and excelling above all else. somebody. Absolutely. The days of being able to throw a bunch of money at someone and just be like, go and do your job, sit at your desk, stare at your computer for eight to 10 hours a day. Give me the results I want to see and pack up and leave. And we'll pretend like we don't know each other or we pass each other and say, hi, Bill, how's it going? Like those days are 100% gone. They're gone for businesses that want to be competitive and win. If you want to continue with that, like I think companies and leaders have to do an honest assessment of themselves as an organization and themselves as a leader. Like when you walk in the door, what is that like? How do you treat your employees? How do you engage with your employees? Is there some room for improvement? And if anyone says no, I'm calling BS. Yeah. (laughs) I'm serious. There's always room for improvement, even on the margins. And going back to the story. So you asked me, (laughs) you said, so do you want to be a full-time employee? And I said, do you want the nice answer or the honest answer? And you kind of (laughs) tilted your head a little bit. And you're like, of course, I want the honest one. But you said, okay, what will it take? And like, I'm pretty low maintenance. and, And don't you know I'm low maintenance, but I'm pretty low maintenance. I love what I do. I pour everything I have into whether it's, a project or it's my team or it's my family or whatever it is. But I had a pretty lengthy list because at the time, <laughs> the culture, there was no light at the end of the tunnel for the team. And I could see that day one when I walked in the door. And let's just say they did a really good job of selling the role to me, which is fantastic. It just was a completely different role. I don't know which one they were selling, but it wasn't the one at that organization. Yeah. And it looked great on paper. But 
And so you said, check, got it, give me 90 days. And so not only did you say what you were going to do, you did it in record time. And I think it was like day 60, you're like, okay, you asked me to do X, Y, and Z. This is what I did. Are you going to hold up to your end of the bargain? And of course I am because I'm a person of my word here. And by that time, there was a light at the tunnel. Like, how can these teams become partners with a business and not just a doormat? And you absolutely made some tweaks. And there were some big ones. And some of them were people. Some of them were processes. But again, you were trying to sell me and you did it in the right way. And you said what you were going to do. I was thankful I delivered on all of it because you stuck around, which was pretty <laughs> good. Stick around, yeah. I don't think there's enough time on the podcast to do the debate of low maintenance, high maintenance. So we'll let that go. <laughs> but the one thing is, is you always deliver for your team, which is huge. But going back to that private equity thing, when we talk about no excuses, I think that's a big thing because we've been through that. And I wanted to say one of the leaders on the private equity inserted team, but I think leaders would not be the appropriate title. I'm not even sure manager is. We could call that person an executive, but an attrition rate that we had taken from the 40s by hiring and selecting the right people and knowing the teams and knowing the team dynamic and what people you needed to place into that sales team drop that by over half and then you depart. And I think they had a banner quarter. They went from 51% to 47% attrition. I learned that the other day. But if you're attriting people, this particular guy from the private equity firm wants to blame product, wants to blame service, wants to blame, to your point, There just seems to be nobody in the world that can hold up a mirror at this guy and for him to see that the problem is him. He just doesn't get it. And that's the thing about this COVID pandemic is leaders, those listening here, it is your responsibility. Carly's right. This is one environmental condition. There are going to be pandemics, fire drills, changes in market, all kinds of things. You have got to be leading and taking care of your team. And people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. So don't talk about the great attrition. You need to be being the boss that you want to work for. And we would do these climate surveys and Carly, everything that would come back on you. And then you remember as Jody and Miranda, everybody was aspiring to be like you. And that's how I knew we struck gold. When we got that, we were golden. Well, thanks for that. I think a lot of the audience are probably in a similar state as a lot of our clients where they're at this like triage state where they're like, they're just trying to plug holes in the ship or the boat or whatever. And I think it's really important to have some pretty direct conversations with the key people on your team if you're afraid of losing them. Right. And that does require you to take some ownership and be like, here's what's going on, right? It's to the best, like, obviously, there's things that you can't share, but being honest and transparent and asking questions like, what can I be doing better for you, right? People generally now feel pretty comfortable to give their opinions on stuff. They do. The environment that we have here at Talent War Group, we get some pretty honest feedback and good, bad, ugly, like, Hey, if I screw up, I want to know about it. If I ticked you off, I want to know about it. Typically, it's not intentional, right? It's just sometimes I'm moving so fast and somebody's got to say, hey, hey, can you explain this to me? I'm like, yeah, sorry. Let me sit down and let's walk through that and address any questions that you may have. And hopefully it didn't affect your day or anything that you're doing. But I think a lot of your audience is probably in this triage state. And so what should people be doing right now? right? Like in this triage, because you can't go into this phone, okay, let's build out this leadership development program. If that's not already in place, like people are plugging holes right now. One of the things that I would say, and I think I have my personal biases that I think some of this blending of politics into the workplace, I just don't like it. 
but I think people are afraid of having authentic conversations. I think people are afraid of getting to know people. And I think people ought to look at it, especially leaders ought to look at it the other way, is that the blending of the personal and the professional happened and continues to happen. And so as a leader, you need to bring your whole self But you also need to recognize that the talent that you have, you need to be investing in them. You need to know them. You need to make them better. Whether or not they're staying or not is not a question you should be asking. You should always be investing, mentoring, coaching, training, listening. There's a skill that most managers and leaders could always improve on. I know I could. And listening to their people, what do they want? What do they need? What do they value? What motivates them so that they feel good about bringing their best selves to work and being part of a community? I think that's one of the things that we did really, really well on our team. And it's not simply because I was in the role. I think I created the space for us to do that in some ways. But we built a team And the team knew everything about everybody, not from a gossip perspective, but we really cared about how this team did. And it wasn't just the performers. If somebody was slacking off or somebody was having a bad week, bad day, God knows in talent acquisition, it's a masochistic world. I mean, we had all kinds of crazy manager tricks, crazy candidate tricks. We were always picking them up. So for me, I think it's always about investing the most important thing that you have in your people. That's your time and your ears. And I don't think people are doing enough of it and they're not bringing their authentic self to the table to do that. Right. Working with some of our clients and going through exit interview data and feedback. And one of the things that has really stood out to me is People don't feel like they can be themselves at work, whether that's in a virtual environment or that is an in-person environment. And I was like, I wonder what that truly means, right? And so it kind of brought me back to this company that we used to work at. And so when I had taken on the global role, I was like, okay, I've got to figure out these teams. I was taking on global teams that I had had a minimal interaction with. And there were people that had been at the company for five, 10 years, and both in the US or whether that was in EMEA or that was over in Asia Pacific, and they had never really talked to each other. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I thought this team was already established. Like I have to go in here. The team had to get to know each other and work with each other. And they're like, yeah, yeah, hey, I've never worked with this girl in the UK. I'm like, she's been here since 2015. I like fast forward four or five years, you've never talked to her. Yeah. Nope. I never talked to each other. And it made me think of something because you see people and we've all had Zoom fatigue, but people are doing these virtual happy hours. Mm -hmm. They think it's a team building event. But when we do them, I'm thinking this is an opportunity for me as a leader to get to know my people. This isn't just a trick. This just isn't a tip. This isn't something we schedule so we can drink on Zoom. That's a nice side benefit, of course. But when we would have them, it was like people got to see the real me and I got to hear about their lives and their kids and everybody's got their stressors. And you're right. I don't know that people are kind of looking at what the surface thing is instead of looking at people could really value and need these things to be connected to be part of a community, to be part of some greater purpose, to really be part of a team that they know has got their back. There's just so many things that leaders could do. And I was talking to a client the other day and I said, I talked about two separate leaders. I'm like, when do they talk? They're both critical components of your company. When do they talk? When do they socialize? When do they get together? When do they talk about how their teams can work together? And the answer was, well, I don't know. I'm like, Oh my God, I thought we were so advanced, but in many ways we're not. I hear this so many times. So in a lot of these leadership ecosystems within, whether it's a small or large organization, there will be someone who is a little bit more reserved. And usually there's an ask for me to come in and coach that individual, which is fantastic. I love doing that. 
But one of the statements I always hear is like, we're a bunch of A-type personalities and this person just needs to speak up more. And I literally ask the question, and if anyone knows me, I am very blunt, which I'm like, do you ever shut up? Like, do you give them the opportunity to speak, right? And like, you obviously hired them for a reason. You hired them for their leadership, their thought leadership. Like maybe if you just shut your mouth for just a little bit and provided a venue for that person, then where would your business be if you did? Yeah, it's reminded me of another tip. And I thought that we did this very, very well. And I share it. It's not something that we created. I'm sure that you and I have learned it from other great leaders that we've worked with. But when we would promote somebody or give somebody a team lead or we hired in a manager, which we rarely did, we mostly promoted. And I remember this with you and I remember Jody Miranda is once you've made that hiring decision, that person's not going to work out on their own. And so one of the things that we did is we said, listen, first 90 days, what do I expect of you? Yeah, little to nothing, little to nothing. I took the burden and you did, you took the burden off leaders that we were promoting. And that's happening now with the great resignation. Now people are having to step up and be in positions. Don't put the expectations on that person's shoulders that they are going to go from one position to another and be killing it because A, you didn't do it as a manager or a leader. So give those people room to grow and now realize their success or failure is now all on you. Yep. Amen. So I gotta tell you, I know that we're at time, Carly. We just wanted to give some good tips, but it all boils down to, it doesn't matter what the external environment the conditions are. When you're a leader, you need to lead. You need to take care of people. And for me, I hate to say it, it's a very snowflake term, but it really is smart, which is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So if you're not investing in people, as a leader, giving them the benefit, helping them get to where you are, you could expect to be another statistic in the great resignation. But what would you leave people with and leaders with to make sure that they're taking great care of people and building the right climate? I think it's time to take a pause to do a little self-reflection as yourself as a leader and figure out where are you making excuses? Figure that out first and then make minor adjustments, or maybe there's some major adjustments, but make those adjustments. It's time to do some self-reflection. If you think you're the best and you're just going to shrug it off, then I'd like to speak with you in six months and see how your department or your company is doing. Truly. I love that, Dr. Phil quote. How's that working out for you? (laughs) How's that working out for you? Yeah, but take a humble step back and do some self-reflection and Okay, we've been dealing with COVID, which feels like a century now, but we're going on almost two years now. So it's not an excuse anymore. What can you change? What can you change? We are going to leave it at that because the best leaders I've worked for have always been their own worst critic and always tried to get better. And I've tried to be that way to the best of my ability. I know I'm my own worst critic. I don't know that I've done everything that I can do. Always trying to get better. But I remember what can you do? And the better you get, the better you better get. The better you better get. (laughs) Which is always true. So thanks, Carly, for being on the Talent War podcast. All the leaders out there, listen, the great resignation is just one more factor in an ever-challenging world. This is just a moment. You lead your way through it. You be humble. You be driven. Be resilient. And if you want some help, just reach out to us at the Talent War Group. And we're out. And thank you for listening to the Talent War Podcast, where we discuss all things talent, focusing on a true talent mindset, which is a core belief that the only true competitive advantage you can hope to achieve and maintain is your talent. Join us for the next episode of the Talent War Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you heard, subscribe, please leave a review and connect with Dr. Tom Lokar and myself on Talent War Group's LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram accounts and send your comments and inquiries to media at Talent War Group. The Talent War Podcast is brought to you by the Talent War Group, a management consulting and executive search firm. 
With services like talent acquisition, leadership development, seminars, and executive coaching, we will work with you to create talent solutions to your business problems. To get started, please visit us at www.talentwargroup.com.